testing one two three testing testing one two three testing one two three Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, ready? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for your patience. We are connected to the wider world, which is always a nice thing. I'm Tom Putnam, the director here of the museum. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this special presentation and conversation with Scott Edwards. Lo, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, the time of the singing of birds has come. These are the scriptural words that adorn William Brewster's grave in Mount Auburn Cemetery. On this chilly night, it may not feel exactly like winter is fully past, but uh, the forecast, both short and long term, is promises warming temperatures. Uh, my wife and I went out on one of our favorite walks this weekend in the small coastal main town where we grew up and now live, and we were happily serenaded by two red-winged blackbirds as the time of their return to New England has come. On behalf of my colleagues at the Concord Museum and Mass Audubon, uh, let me just say how pleased we are that you will have all uh, joined us here this evening, both in person and those of you watching via the live stream. Uh, for tonight's forum, which is offered in conjunction with our new temporary exhibit, Alive with Birds, William Brewster in Concord. The exhibit features unique artifacts on loan from Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology, artwork from Mass Audubon's Museum of American Bird Art, and a mesmerizing multimedia program capturing both the history and the beauty of Brewster's Woods. The exhibit was jointly curated by the museum and Mass Audubon, and one of the unique features is the pairing of quotes from William Brewster's journals with the artwork on display. The final painting features these words, which we learn are the very last written by Brewster here in Concord on May 14th, 1919. He would die some eight weeks later. These are his words. Cloudless, windless, and of summer-like warmth, the day was simply perfect, as befitted one which brought the very highest perfection of blossoming apple orchards and fields carpeted with golden dandelions. When I awoke at daybreak, a crested flycatcher was calling the orchard. At breakfast time, a late and rare-voiced wood thrush was whining in the run. Besides these were our usual Orioles, Phoebes, and Purple Finch, all together a glad choir of delightful bird music. Ah, to delight in golden dandelions, the only flower that my green thumb consistently cultivates. Not only does that delightful choir of bird music that Brewster so beautifully described lives on, but so too does his spirit, in part because of his professional and spiritual ear heirs, two of whom join us this evening. Let me thank them both for being here and ask David O'Neill, the current president of Mass Audubon, a role first held by William Brewster himself to introduce this evening's speaker. Before arriving in Concord in 2020, David served as the Chief Conservation Officer and Senior Advisor to the CEO of the National Audubon Society. It's been a great pleasure working with David and his team on this new exhibit and these jointly sponsored public programs. As I pass the microphone over to him, I do so with appreciation and gratitude for this successful partnership. David. This is the second time I've had to follow Tom in a presentation. Um, but thank you, Tom. Thank you for all that you've done for this amazing exhibit and for the wonderful partnership and all you've done for Concord. Um, let me just uh, start by saying um, that I am the 11th president of Mass Audubon in a 125-year period, and there are some very big shoes to fill over that period of time. So I take this uh, job with a great deal of humility and hope for the future of birds and future of the nature of Massachusetts. Brewster was one of the country's earliest advocates for the protection of nature and the protection of birds. His work at Mass Audubon led to seminal national environmental 
policies, including the 1900 Lacey Act and the 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Both of those acts have led to the protection of hundreds of species of birds from extinction over the last 100 years. We're fortunate in that in 2019, a portion of October Farm, Brewster's Woods, um, which is now called Brewster's Woods, which was owned at the time by William Brewster back in 125 years ago, um, is now a part of Mass Audubon. And the parcel of land um, is, uh, represents the largest gift in the history of Mass Audubon. And it was the generous donation of Nancy Bucus, who lives here in Concord, that allowed us to, uh, provided for us to be able to have this property. It was to be developed into 98 residential units. Can you imagine um, tearing up this sacred ground? So we are indebted to Nancy for her for foresight and her amazing generosity. So now let me turn it over to uh, the introduction of our honored guest here, Scott Edwards. Scott was born in Hawaii and his interest in ornithology and natural history began as a child growing up in the Bronx where he undertook his first job in environmental science um, at the Wave Hill Environmental Science, and science Center. He received his undergraduate degree from Harvard in 1986, and today Scott Edwards is the professor of zoology and curator of ornithology in the Museum of Contemporary Zoology at Harvard U University. William Brewster also serves as the curator of the museum in 1885. Scott came to Harvard in December 2003 after serving as faculty for nine years in the zoology department at the University of Washington. His research focuses on the diverse aspects of avian biology, including evolutionary history and population genetics. Scott has served on the National Geographic's Committee for Research and Exploration, the Senior Advisor Boards of NSF, and on the Advisory Boards of the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian, the Cornell School of Ornithology, and fortunately for me, Mass Audubon. <laughs> he has devoted his career to increasing the number of people of color involved in the environmental sciences, and in 2020 was awarded the inaugural Inclusiveness, Diversity, Equity, and Access Award from the Society of the Study of Evolution. Just a, a couple other interesting points about Scott. He took a, a short little ride on his bike, as maybe some of you know, uh, in 2020, where uh, he started here and, and made his way to the Northwest across the entire country uh, during the pandemic in a period of turmoil in society in many ways. Um, but just for fun, I have learned that Scott's also a lover of pasta and loves to color orange no doubt because of his love for the Baltimore Oriole. <clears throat> so tonight, Scott will talk about his work on avian evolutionary biology at Harvard. He'll touch on William Brewster and his assistant, William Brewster's assistant, Robert Gilbert, the importance of community science and connecting with birds in the 21st century. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to my friend, Scott Edwards. Scott. Thanks very much, David, and thank you, Tom, for this really great opportunity. It's great to connect with lots of friends here. Thanks so much for coming out. I know it's still a bit tenuous getting together in person, but um, I'm really glad you're here, and I think it's going to be a great evening. Uh, and uh, hello to all the folks online that are watching us as well. Uh, I thought I would uh, kind of mash up a few different things tonight. Um, you're probably aware that uh, the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard has basically all of William Brewster's birds. And, um, and, and that's an amazing legacy. And there's a huge amount of stuff we can learn uh, from that collection. Uh, and then uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, just museums in general and what kind of, what role do they play in science and in society. Uh, and then finally, uh, what I wanted to do was to uh, try to convince you that uh, 
these old collections, sometimes often over 100 years old, still have, are really, really important for understanding of, of, of birds and other groups of organisms and for conservation and just for understanding where, how the Earth is responding to some of its current stressors like climate change. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the details uh, I, some numbers that I just put together over the last week. Um, we have all of Brewster's birds databased uh, digitally in, in, at the museum. And um, I'll just show you some high level insights that I gained just by looking at uh, crunching a few numbers. And then uh, I'll segue to talk a bit about uh, sort of some of Brewster's contemporaries. Uh, we'll meet uh, Louis Agassiz, the infamous original director of the Museum of Comparative Zoology. Uh, and we'll meet um, one of my longtime heroes, Eugene Bicknell of Bicknell's Thrush. Both Eugene and I grew up in Riverdale, New York, so we're, uh, we're bosom buddies. And then I figured I would um, end with a few vignettes of some of the amazing stuff that you can do with these old, dead birds. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're very lucky at Harvard that the powers that be uh, felt it appropriate to keep our collection on campus. I can tell you that at many universities around the country, collections have been deemed not useful. They take up too much space. They cost too much money. And so they've been given away, or they've uh, perhaps been moved off campus. So fortunately, neither of those has happened to us at Harvard. And before I begin, I just want to give a big shout out for some of the uh, colleagues I have uh, in the collection and at the Ernst Meyer Library. Jeremiah Trimble helped put together a lot of the, uh, the, the photographs that you'll see. Mary Sears of the Ernst Meyer Library was really spearheading a lot of the digitization of some of William Brewster's letters and whatnot, some of which are available online now. And Robert Young, who's in charge of the rare book room at um, uh, the Ernst Meyer Library, uh, just a few days ago, um, pointed me to some really amazing um, letters that I'll share with you uh, from William Brewster. So to start off, the bird department today, of which I'm curator, is a vibrant, living, active department. And that means we're still collecting birds responsibly and across many, many countries, including the United States. And uh, this is, I would say, we're one of maybe 10 or 15 museums in the country that still engage in active research and collection. We can't say the same thing about collections in Europe. Most of those museums are essentially moribund when it comes to research-driven uh, collecting. But as you can see here, um, this is a world-class resource. We're the fifth largest collection in the world. That's, that's including the big museum in New York City, the Smithsonian Field Museum in Chicago. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and um, it's, but it's married, these, these old birds are married with a modern computer database and modern research practices that make it really exciting. Um, so I just, in a matter of minutes, I basically downloaded all the the allotment that really uh, of Brewster's specimens. It's about 40,000 birds. And I just sort of organized it a bit. And uh, I wanted to see what it was about. This exhibit that the Muse Concord Museum has put on has really been inspiring to me to just learn a bit more about uh, Brewster's collection, what we have uh, at the museum. And so you can see here, what I've done is just to trace the, um, the, the dates, the date of collection of all of uh, roughly 30,000 of the 40,000 uh, specimens in the Brewster allotment. So it starts way back in 1858 on the left and goes to about 18, 1918 on the right. There's actually a few uh, birds in there purportedly collected by Brewster after he died in 1919. <laughs> Who knows what's going on with that? But uh, you can see that you know the number of specimens, which you see there on the y-axis, it, it's sort of trickling along at, at uh, about 500 per year until about 1884 when it really shoots up um, to uh, upwards of 5,000 and then declines. And, you know, I've read about Brewster undergoing a bit of a conversion of sorts. You know, he was a strong collector in his, uh, early in his career. And then he, he felt that uh, 
you know, continued collecting wasn't the way to go, and then and appropriately he turned to conservation. And that may be what we see in this precipitous drop here at about 1890. Um, but um, that's, you know, that, that, that needs to be verified. But it's quite interesting, and I think Brewster's collection reflects the sort of age distribution of the MCZ collection as a whole. In other words, most of our birds date to the late 19th century, with a much smaller number heading into the 20th century. Now, um, these are, uh, on the x-axis here, you've got all of the states from which Brewster's birds came from. There are about 8,000 birds in the allotment that we know were collected by Brewster. And as you might expect, the largest number comes from um, Massachusetts. It's a little over 5,000. Um, but, uh, sorry, that's a little, yeah, that's a, sorry, 3,500. And then, of course, his second love, Maine, uh, there's a, a bunch from there. And then there's a long tail uh, of um, specimens from other states. But these are all birds that have Brewster's name on them. And so it would be interesting to see, did he actually travel to all these places? Uh, I suspect it's a mix of him having traveled and him having just attributed some to himself, collected by others. Now, uh, there is an international dimension to this collection. And so, uh, for example, the three main countries represented are, of course, the United States. But then there's a number of birds from Canada, as well as from Trinidad and Tobago, which were, uh, Brewster actually visited, um, uh, made a short trip uh, to, uh, to uh, collect specimens there. Um, and then there's a long tail of a small number of birds from other countries. This uh, particular graph doesn't really capture a, a major uh, site of interest for Brewster, which was Mexico. Uh, you can see there's one bird here which has Brewster's name on it from Mexico. But it turns out there's uh, several thousand birds, uh, a little over, uh, a little under 7,000 to be exact, which were in the Brewster allotment and which hail from Mexico. And this, what you see here, are all of the different collectors that Brewster fanned out across uh, uh, at various times to bring back specimens from Mexico. This is a, um, a, a Mexican jay. Uh, collected in Mexico by one of his key collaborators, which is this guy, um, uh, Frizar, who, uh, as we'll see, uh, played a really important role in, um, in a mass, helping amass Brewster, Brewster's collection. Now, uh, this guy, uh, uh, Frizar, is quite interesting because uh, he was one of, he, he exemplifies, in many ways, the way in which the MCZ bird collection grew. It didn't grow through targeted research on different topics. It grew through an ambition to create the most comprehensive bird collection uh, in the United States. And Fazar was one of many professional collectors that were paid to bring specimens back to the MCZ. And just last week, I was able to view some of the correspondence between Fazar and Brewster this correspondence is not yet digitized, although we hope to certainly put it online uh, very soon. And um, it's quite interesting because uh, it, it shows how these two guys, Brewster and Frazar, they wanted to talk brass tacks, they wanted to talk birds, how are things going in the field. And at the same time, as you'll see, there's a bit of diversions as well. And so, uh, for example, writing from Lomita Ranch in Texas on March 21st, 1880, uh, Abbott Marston Frazar wrote, the best birds I have taken so far are one white-tailed buzzard, one other scene, five beardless flycatchers, which I think are probably beardless tyrannulets, uh, not rare, 15 San Domingo grebes, which we call least grebes today, uh, have not seen over five more, 26 Texas cardinals, which I'm pretty sure are paraloxias, that thing from the southwest, uh, and between 30 and 40 black-crested titmice. So a very interesting group of, of birds. As you can see, uh, there's also another element to the correspondence, which is really interesting. As you can see, uh, this guy was in Texas for over a year, uh, constantly writing to, uh, to Brewster about what he's been finding. But at one point, he confesses that uh, I had very little to regret on leaving there at L Lomita Ranch, but I was rather sorry to part with the only female society I have had since being in the state. 
there was a San Antonio young lady living there, pretty lively as anyone could wish, a regular flirt. So there you have it. That's guy talk back in the 19th century. Now, um, let's segue a bit and talk about uh, museums and some of the milieu that Brewster was working in. So uh, many of you are aware that uh, the uh, MCZ was founded in 1859 by uh, Louis Agassiz. Uh, swashbuckling uh, Swiss scientist famous for his studies on glaciers. Uh, and um, you can see him here in front of um, these chalkboards, which uh, the, the, the bird collection used to be on the fifth floor of that big brick building that you saw on the first slide. And uh, at some point, the deans saw fit to uh, put some actual warm living bodies up there rather than a bunch of dead birds. Uh, fortunately, we were uh, moved only next door to a really brand new facility uh, underground in the Northwest Lab. And these chalkboards were actually revealed for the first time in 150 years during that move. It was quite exciting. And so we couldn't resist having a little fun. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to capture that gravitas that uh, Agassiz, uh, you know, just conveys there. Um, now, uh, all kidding aside, you know, the seamy side of this, of course, is that, um, you know, Agassiz participated in a, a really sort of uh, uh, seamy uh, perspective of uh, how human diversity is organized and how the world is put together. You, he, he didn't believe in evolution, so he was an anti-evolutionist. Um, perhaps ironically, however, the museum was organized in a way that's very intuitive from a comparative evolutionary standpoint. Now, uh, you might have heard about the recent controversy of the uh, photographs of slaves that Agassiz took that are housed in the Peabody Museum, which is sort of the sister museum to the uh, zoology museum. These were photographs that were presumably taken against the will of slaves, and some of the modern descendants were understandably upset that uh, the museum still had these pictures. Anyway, there's been a book written about them now. And it just shows how much work needs to be done in the so-called process of so-called decolonization. That's what a lot of museums are thinking about. We're thinking about how can we uh, cleanse ourselves, if you will, of what in many cases was a, a very uh, amassing collections through brute force or other kinds of oppression in far off places and often not giving credit to the local folks. So this is a challenge, I would say, for museums. And um, you know, it's really on everyone's mind who is working in a museum. Now, an example of this is Robert Gilbert, who is uh, mentioned in the exhibit upstairs, who was an African-American who um, was working at Brewster's side for uh, many decades. And uh, I have to say, I, I wasn't really aware of Gilbert until I moved to Concord. Um, uh, when my wife and I moved to Concord um, back in 2003, they sell uh, Gilbert's uh, biography in the, in the Mass Audubon Drumlin Farm bookstore. Uh, now, Gilbert, you know, it's, it's, we, we don't know that much about him, quite frankly. Uh, he was an assistant to William Brewster as early as 1895. He contributed a lot to the exhibits at the MCZ. He likely contributed far more to Brewster's success than he's acknowledged for. And I looked in the MCZ database, and out of 400,000 birds and an allotment of 40,000 specimens, only two of them are attributed to Gilbert. And I just wonder how much that's an, an underestimate. Um, now, when uh, Gilbert uh, died, he was given an obituary in the AUK, the leading bird journal. And interestingly, it's actually a really poignant memoriam. It doesn't even mention that he's black. And I think that's actually nice. And you know, it's, we need to learn more about many of these un, unsung heroes that have um, helped to build these amazing resources. We know that Gilbert took a lot of photographs that uh, Brewster used in his research. Um, but there's a lot more, I suspect, to be learned. And so it's, it's very exciting um, you know, to, to learn about Gilbert. We've since renamed one of the rooms in the MCZ taken Agassiz's name off and put Gilbert's on. It's a small token, uh, but um, you know, there's a lot of, of work to be done, I would say. Let's 
end now just thinking about how it is that museums are playing important roles in both research and education um, here uh, in, the, in the United States. Um, and, um, you know, honestly, the reason I came to Harvard was because it had a museum. I've, 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 I was trained in museums, and I think they're really important for understanding um, biodiversity and evolution. And, um, you know, we're very fortunate at Harvard to be teaching the so-called ologies, meaning things like ornithology or entomology or herpetology. Uh, these are courses which sadly have been dropped from the curricula of many leading organizations um, and, and leading universities. For example, Stanford, Princeton, they both gave their collections away. Uh, and I doubt they have a course in ornithology there. Uh, we're very fortunate at the museum to be able to teach these to really eager undergraduates. I have a, a bumper crop this year, over 30 students. And um, as you'll see, we have a really great time. Uh, you know, ornithology is a really challenging course to teach. It involves field identification, anatomy, and physiology. We go into the fossil history of birds population biology, and we use the collections a lot. And so we're hoping to you know, convince the next generation that collections are still important. In fact, we just came back from a spring break trip to Texas. In fact, it was remarkably close to that Lamita Ranch that uh, Frizar was just uh, writing Brewster from. And I want to go back and sort of triangulate and see some of the uh, common species. Um, it was an amazing trip. and. Um, you can see here, this is, we are in, in this shot, we were in the lower, lower uh, Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge, which is an amazing um, area to, uh, to look at. And um, it's, I definitely, we were, it's just a little too early for spring, for migration. We saw a few wintering warblers, but I definitely want to return and, and uh, to this uh, amazing region of the country. So, um, you know, museums today, as I mentioned, are, are vibrant. They're recording the, evolutionary history of different species. And perhaps importantly for my own research, we're uh, amassing not only the, the phenotypes, sort of the, the way, the size and shape of organisms in the specimens, but we're also harboring their, uh, their DNA. We're basically, museums have assumed the role of custodians of our Earth's genetic legacy. And this is a really remarkable and very important role uh, we can essentially take time slices and understand how life has changed on the planet uh, as we uh, harbor different, sa different samples. I like to think of specimens not just about, it's not just about taxonomy. It's about a snapshot of the environment at a particular place and time that a specimen was taken. On these birds, for example, the Hawaiian honey creepers, uh, we can see uh, pollen from plants that they've uh, taken nectar from. We can look for feather mites and understand what parasites are, uh, are t getting a ride with them. We can look at stable isotopes, chemical signatures, which tell us some of the things they ate. We can get DNA from them and understand their uh, genetic diversity through time. And so these old specimens have a lot to tell us about where birds have come from and where they are going. And so uh, the first vignette involves some of my favorite birds. These are albatrosses. Uh, as David told you, I was born in Hawaii, and I've been lucky to return to some of the leeward Hawaiian islands where these birds uh, live. It's an amazing um, stretch of islands heading up towards the uh, northwest from the eight, eight main Hawaiian islands. And uh, you're probably aware that just a few years ago, this was uh, uh, designated a national monument, a marine national monument. Very, very amazing place. Now, we've done some work to measure how much genetic diversity is in the albatrosses of these leeward Hawaiian islands. And that's what you'll see on this slide. You can see on the x-axis, we have different designations of endangerment by the IUCN, the International uh, Union of uh, of, of conservation. On the y-axis, we have measures of genetic diversity. So, for example, these green circles, LC, least concern, and NT, near threatened, you can see their genetic diversity is, um, the, the least concern has higher genetic diversity than some of the other endangered classes. 
what was sobering for us in this study was to learn that these two albatrosses, their level of genetic diversity is commensurate with them being uh, vulnerable. You can see this yellow circle there. Um, and so they have lower genetic diversity than we might hope for a bird uh, of, their, uh, their, of their census numbers. And of course, genetic diversity is what organisms need to respond to a changing planet. So this is something that we need to think about. Another really interesting study, which I should mention, was driven by an undergraduate at Harvard, was to understand the effect of heavy metals on these isolated albatross populations. We might think that they're off in the middle of the Pacific. They're not the subject of any um, environmental assaults. So we wanted to ask that question. And so we teamed up with some researchers at the Harvard School of Public Health, and we measured the amount of organic mercury in the feathers of century-old albatross specimens. Many of these albatrosses were probably taken not through active collecting, but simply through bycatch, through uh, inadvertently catching these birds in, in fisheries, fisheries nets. But you can see this black line here going all the way back to 1880, that the amount of organic mercury in these birds has been steadily increasing over time. Um, Again, something we learned from uh, century-old museum specimens. And this, of course, is another reason for concern. Uh, when the study was published, it got quite a lot of, of, of media attention because um, it was unexpected. We didn't expect such a pristine, or at least a, you know, naively pristine uh, landscape to have uh, these sorts of environmental assaults. Of course, if you go to these islands, you'll see that the beaches are just littered with plastic. It's crazy. The, I think plastics in the ocean is a really, really big problem out there. Another thing we look at is tracking genetic diseases. These are house finches, common bird around Concord. And yet they're um, the target of a rapidly evolving disease called a mycoplasma. And over the years, we've been studying how it is that these birds are responding to this novel environmental agent. And the great thing is, is through the work of uh, museums, we have a snapshot of these birds before this disease emerged in the early 1990s. So we know what house finches looked like uh, genetically and morphologically from the late 1980s using collections that were collected for completely unrelated reasons. So comparing these uh, house finches with house finches sampled in the early 2000s or mid 2000s has told us a lot that this bird is evolving in response to this novel pathogen. It's Another case of very rapid evolutionary change. Evolution doesn't require millions and millions of years to, uh, to take its course. It can change in, the, in a matter of decades. And then finally, uh, I sort of uh, had a great opportunity to sort of go back to my own roots, uh, back to Riverdale and uh, uh, Eugene Bicknell, again at the instigation of a Harvard undergraduate. Um, this undergraduate hailed from upstate New York. And he said he had spent his spring break trying to find Bicknell's thrush, and he was unsuccessful. So I said, well, why don't we study that? That would be fun. Um, Eugene Bicknell was a 19th century naturalist, grew up in New York. And in fact, my very first publication was a comparison of birds that Eugene Bicknell found in Riverdale with those of, that I had seen living there in the uh, late 1970s. Um, and Bicknell, we only have about 20 specimens of his uh, in our MCZ collection, but it's quite an interesting uh, uh, sample of birds from Riverdale, New York. So um, we looked at the gray cheek thrush and the Bicknell thrush. These thrushes are really interesting because they're what we call cryptic species, meaning they look basically identical. You can't tell them apart just by their size and shape. The only thing that really differentiates them is their song, OK? So what, hearing them. And of course, Bicknell's thrush you would see uh, up in the um, Adirondacks, up into southern Canada and the White Mountains. Uh, Great cheek thrush, of course, is much more widespread, heading uh, uh, up into the uh, uh, coniferous forests uh, in uh, southern Canada. And so we teamed up with folks from the um, Albany State Museum, where they had a really nice collection of, of blood samples in this case from Bicknell's thrush. And we learned a lot of really interesting things about how these two species diverged. One of the most interesting things we learned was that these two species 
had a common ancestor as recently as 15,000 years ago, which might sound like a, a long time. It's actually a very short time in sort of uh, evolutionary uh, frameworks. And this is quite interesting to think that Bicknell's thrush is such a young species. It was only recognized as a full species uh, in the 1990s. The other thing we learned is that throughout most of their DNA, they're really, really similar. It turns out they've diverged specifically in regions of the genome that are related to song and brain function, which might suggest, uh, give us a mechanism as to how they, they diverge. And so this sort of uh, curiosity-based science is um, really, I think, exciting. And it's, I think, one way in which we can inspire uh, the next generation to, uh, you know, treat uh, and care for uh, the biodiversity of, of, of the planet. Now, when I moved to Harvard, they had this crazy headline. They said, Edwards studies birds with genetic databases, not binoculars. <laughs> I, was a little, I was a little offended by that. <laughs> Hopefully, I've convinced you that it's not true. Uh, all of our questions come from natural history. and. Um, it's uh, working at the MCC is a great opportunity to bring uh, these really neat discoveries uh, to you and, and the rest of the public. So thank you very much. Looking forward to our discussion. Yeah. Thank you. I'll sit over here. Yeah. That was fun. That was fun. <laughs> yeah. A lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I was struck by the one slide that says, archives of, en of environmental history. And um, I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. But can you tell us, Scott, what are we learning about the specimens that are being collected and studied today that give us a sense of what's happening in the environment? Right, well, yeah, yeah thanks. That's a good question. Um, you know, methods for studying uh, specimens have changed through time. And, and today, of course, we have just an am amazing tools to look very finely at how birds are responding to changes in the environment. And so, for example, we can measure their, the color of their plumage and ask, how is that changing across the landscape? And just this morning, I was lecturing in my class about how a, there was a study in Europe where they monitored the uh, uh, temperature rise over the last 120 years. In some areas, it was climate change was going faster than in other uh, areas. And they showed, using museum specimens, that the color of these chaffinches was changing in concert with temperature. And so these, are, these, these collections are allowing us to, to view how organisms are responding to the environment. There's also a lot of you know, important work looking at you know, details of how genes are expressed and how they're responding to changing climate in, at the molecular level. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really remarkable what we're learning about how bird populations are responding to climate change. And um, a really big push these days is, is the so-called extended specimen, where we're basically trying to get as much information um, from individual specimens. It might be the call, it might be the behavior, the habitat. So it's, um, it's, it's a very rapidly changing field. Yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic. I, I, I worry about climate change, I'm sure all of us do. And I wonder about how fast, how quickly birds can adapt. Can they adapt quickly enough for the change that's occurring? Yeah, that's a great. That, do we have evidence that they are adapting quickly to this, or are there just huge concerns? Well, I think there are concerns, and I would say it's still early to make broad generalizations. For example, one of the earliest studies to look at how birds are responding to climate change showed, this is a study in Europe, it showed that the uh, invertebrate prey of a particular flycatcher called the collared flycatcher was um, the, so there was basically an evolving mismatch between when the birds were migrating north to Europe from Africa and when its prey was, uh, you know, coming out. Um, and so, uh, you know, the cues that birds use to migrate north 
are slightly different than the cues which tell the caterpillars to emerge. And when there's that mismatch, that's going to cause problems in terms of the prey base. And so um, that would be, you know, we have this moniker uh, where we say, well, with climate change, you either move, adapt, or die. You can either move with the habitat as it's uh, put, being pushed up a mountain slope or farther north. You can adapt, stay in the same place. And you know, we're, I think the jury is still out on that. Sadly, without those two options, it's very difficult for a lot of organisms to, to manage the, the rapidly changing yeah, climate. So, totally. Yeah. I worry about that relative to sort of long distant migrants in particular, you know, this mismatch issue. Absolutely, um, yeah. So Scott, we're going to open it up too. So get your questions queued up. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I want to know what's, what's so cool about birds <laughs> and why, why, why is the class that you're teaching now a larger class than you've had maybe recently? So are birds cool? <laughs> birds are very cool. I mean, I think we're talking to a friendly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. I will say, you know, growing up in Riverdale um, and you know going to an all all boys school in Manhattan, birding was not cool. <laughs> I mean, I I did everything I could to keep a lid on the fact that I was into birds. I you know it just was not part of the conversation. Um, but I think you know now. Um, I think a lot of students are, they need to get outside. It's been challenging for students with the pandemic. And um, a lot of them are very excited to, to get outside. And I think a really important part of the class is just to you know, get them outside. We have lots of field trips, most of them locally uh, around the Boston area. We go to uh, several Mass Audubon sanctuaries. And um, I think. And it's not like everyone's a, a, a hotshot birder in the class. I mean, there are plenty of beginners. And um, they have to go out and do a final project where they have to you know, count birds over successive visits to one of the local parks. And um, that's their favorite part of the class, because they can really um, you know, they can crunch their own numbers and really dig into their own projects. So it's, uh, you know, the, we have a very dedicated group of majors in the, the biology major in the museum. And um, uh, once, we, once we separated from the molecular biology folks, our ratings went, went up. <laughs> you know, it's I like. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, good, get rid, get, get rid of them. <laughs> so. All right, so um, having collections like this and still collecting like this is out of oak for sure. Um, internationally, how do you address the sort of ethical questions that are raised uh, at Harvard in still collecting birds? And what's the argument that you would make to someone who would question the importance of doing that? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I mean, you know, what I would say is that the value uh, that, we learn, that we get from uh, responsible and, and very limited collecting um, outweighs uh, what we would lose by not sampling the environment. Mm -hmm. And I would also point out that you know, every week, uh, if you uh, amass all of the bird deaths due to you know, uh, uh, feral cats, pollution, other kinds of environmental assaults, you would basically re recapture the entire MCZ collection. And so I think, um, and I like to think in the Boston area, not every area of the country, but in the Boston area, I think people appreciate that you know, res responsible collecting. You know, museums in some parts of the country, they got to worry about you know, animal rights activists and all kinds of things. I think that um, if we put it in perspective and ask, you know, is scientific work uh, as damaging to birds as man the many other environmental assaults, I think you can make a good case that it's, it's nothing really compared to the, the many other challenges that bird populations have. So, yeah. 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 Feral cats. Um, yeah. Big, big problem. So let, let's open it up. I, I can continue with my questions, but I want to make sure we get a couple first here. <laughs> Maud Baldwin, was she one of your students? Yeah. How do you know Maud? Well, we've been putting together a PowerPoint on hummingbirds. Oh, okay. And it appears in our go-to book 
that we use to start a research on something, Handbook of Birds of the World, that was written in 1999. And in the in the period of the teens, 2000 teens, there's been so much wonderful research. And tell the people what Maud discovered. I mean, that was just yeah. mind-boggling. Thank you. No, I was, I was going to mention some of her work because it really is amazing. She, Maud was interested in how it is that hummingbirds can taste sugar. I and mean, we know that they can tell sugar water from regular water. They can tell it in an instant, right? because we know that from uh, experiments on, on feeders. What most of you might not know, though, is that hummingbirds, and in fact no birds, have the gene that allows we humans to taste sugar. So how do hummingbirds do it? And it's a really interesting story um, that Maud, yeah, figured out uh, several years ago, and she's been following up with different groups of birds. And so, um, yeah, I'll make sure to tell her you said hello. <laughs> there you know, dinosaurs lost it. That's right. And so birds, and most bird species don't have They don't it. have it, don't right. So, so Orioles, turns out, even things like woodpeckers take sugar occasionally. And so just the basic science of how, how do they do this, I think, is a really, really fascinating story. And um, yeah, it tells, it just sort of gives a, a perspective that um, you know, organisms work with what they have. It's not like they can just pull new uh, adaptations out of the sky. They really uh, do some amazing things with what they've been endowed with. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, sir. And Hi, Richard. 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 Yes, the figure you showed of uh, Brewster collected 40,000 birds in your collection, and uh, Robert Gilbert, too. Yeah, that, that kind of stuck in my crawl because uh, I, John Mitchell's a good friend of mine, and, and I read Mr. Gilbert, his book, a long time ago, well, when it came out, and of course I read the Brewster, Brewster books, and so maybe you comment a little bit more about uh, the problems of eyesight, for example, <laughs> that some have claimed and, and so forth. But, and, and then I'd like to go back to another two more things that you mentioned near the beginning. One is about Agassiz, um, who has been, um, has, has been accused, I don't know if that's the right word, of being a racist or something along, something similar. Um, and just recently, Harvard <laughs> uh, changed the name uh, in the MCZ uh, of, of the um, seminar room right. from the Agassiz room to the Gilbert room. And John wrote me a quick email and said, well, who was behind that? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't me. <laughs> No, 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 this was a consensus. Um, yeah, I mean, and you know, look, this is um, window dressing, right? It's, you know, a lot of organizations, Audubon's name, you know, Audubon, what, owned a slave. He did his, everything he could to, you know, hide his Haitian ancestry. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, issues that, um, need to be addressed, I would say, in, in environmental science generally. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we're not gonna save the planet if we continue to uh, interact with a largely white environmental movement. We've got to, everyone's gotta be a part of this. And, you know, there are lots of different ways to do that. Um, and, you know, renaming a room is, it's, it's a very, very, very small first step. Um, I think, though, that, you know, I think it's generally agreed that, that Agassiz was a racist. I mean, I, I don't think that's controversial. Um, and so, um, you know, I think, uh, and it was, it was, it was uh, it seeping through the entire society. And so um, it's, um, it's hard to find someone of his caliber in the 19th century that wasn't a racist. Could you say a little more about um, Gilbert? And yeah, I mean, you know, I think we need to look and see what's available to tell us, to give us a better idea of what 
Gilbert's contributions were. We know he took a lot of photographs uh, for Brewster, and uh, my, you know, there's there's a, a newspaper article. It may have been the Boston Globe uh, after Brewster died, but showed. Gilbert uh, helping to prepare uh, one of the, the llama specimens in the mammal hall, which, and I'm pretty sure I, that, that specimen is still standing. And um, so he was probably pretty good at taxidermy. And, um, you know, in my fantasy, I can imagine, well, maybe we can resurrect his DNA from some of the specimens by, you know, <laughs> it's, it's entirely possible. Um, but yeah, it's, we, we need to do some work to figure out all the contributions that he probably did make. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have the privilege these days of working at this shop at Walden Pond, uh, made famous by no other than Henry. Uh, and it's interesting because I'm there a day, every, every other day or something like that, and that Henry never saw a turkey. Henry never saw a pileated woodpecker, never saw a white-tailed deer. Uh, uh, so many things that have come back here, it's amazing to see. But there's two favorite birds, one by ear would be the joint wood thrush and hermit thrush that he occasionally confused. Um, and, and also the call of the loon. Uh, we have a bit of a battle going on right now. Uh, I work with the Thoreau Society at the moment um, and deal with the Walden Pond staff. Uh, loons have been there at Walden Pond for the last two summers about half of the time, calling, they leave them come chasing fish into the, um, wow. the swimming area. Uh, they love it there, they call them away, and they go over to Sandy Pond. I'm working, uh, I've been dealing with the mass wildlife people in Westboro about the possibility of using a loon uh, floating nest platform that's been used successfully in 80 different lakes in northern and western mass. Uh, but some of the people, this DCR, are not anxious to have a floating nest platform mm -hmm. anchored to the bottom 100 feet into Walden. Uh, but the Thoreauvians, the environmentalists, love seeing the loon. They love hearing the loon. Mm. I can imagine loon tourism there. Yeah. And I can also imagine a major fight in the media between the Thoreauvians and the bird lovers with the recreationists yeah. in the poorly named state institution known as the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Right. Are you fell against trying to put a loon nesting platform that so many people <laughs> are looking We're for? We're going to put you on the spot. Exactly. Exactly. Bureaucrats yeah. don't want. What do you think? No, no, no. I think, it, I think it's a great idea. I think, um, yeah, I, it's, you know, I, uh, Walden Pond's just one of these treasures. Uh, and, you know, you, I, I, you wonder, yeah, I think, and of course people in, in Thoreau's Day used to visit and recreate there. Um, I think I think Thoreau would would love to have a, a loon platform, and I I'd be in favor of it as well. But you know, um, some of the arguments we have in Concord is just kind of crazy. You know, should we put astroturf or real grass on the high school? You know, it's like it's just they can get very um, very uh, you know frill very quickly. But I I would certainly be in favor of it. Yeah. Um, th there are places in the world where there are hundreds of species of hummingbirds, and we only have a couple here. Um, why is that, and how can you relate that to any evolutionary data ab about their genomes? Yeah, that? no, that's a, a great question. I mean, uh, in fact, in my bird class this morning, we had a, de a, a debate. A, the students had a debate as to whether the major groups of birds originated in the southern hemisphere or in the northern hemisphere. And hummingbirds are very uh, germane to this because, yes, most of the species, there's a little over 300 species, they're mostly in South America. And yet, the best fossils that we have of hummingbirds going back 50 million years ago are from Germany. <laughs> no idea. So what's going on with that? You know, and, um, it's, so it's a big debate. Did a lot of our tropical species actually arise in the northern hemisphere and then move south? It's, it's, Is it it's related to one. their sugar uh, abilities? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if they had strudel back then. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, and it's, but it's one of those really challenging questions that happened so long ago. Yeah. You know James McGuire's Research yes. And his 
saying that the hummingbird the hummingbirds moved from Europe where the at least at the time the fossils were found and they went across Asia to Asia and across the Bering Straits came down into South America proliferated Andes went up the Andes gave them a great opportunity to have diverse habitats you know I'm, look, I'm looking for a graduate student <laughs> this is this is really this is impressive this no, this is really impressive that's great <laughs> not just a pretty face Scott <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, Jim McGuire has done some amazing, or he's a, he's but a Berkeley, that's yeah. where he uh, prophesizes that they moved from Europe, crossed the Bering Straits, came down, and uh, just before the Andes started to rise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the kind of information. You probably can't get that from the DNA itself, but the fossils are certainly like, wow, that's pretty... Scott, I'm, I'm interested, you know, in sort of the migration of birds and how we protect birds yeah. in the most important places, you know, wintering grounds, the stopover sites, the breeding grounds. Where do we focus, right? So as a conservation organization, you only have so many resources. You only can do so much. And you have to, in many ways, pinpoint your investments or your strategies. What, how, how's the work that you're doing yeah. helping uh, conservation organizations like ours just be more strategic in yeah. how we invest in the conservation work we're doing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think the best, one of the best pieces of information for that is simply where are birds wintering? Um, birds that breed in North America, where are they wintering? It's amazing how many species we don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I showed the picture of the bobolink there uh, in Brewster's collection. You know, bobolinks winter in this very restricted area of South America in a very particular ha grassland habitat. And so, um, and, and there's many examples of birds just, you know, where we've just discovered the wintering populations of them. And so, um, and you know, uh, not just museum folks, but lots of biologists, of course, are, are doing a lot of uh, detailed mapping of bird migration. They're putting geolocators on birds to find out where they're moving. Um, and that's, I think, the kind of baseline information that could help conservation organizations. It's, it's a really tough problem, and you, I'm sure you've wrestled with it yourself, um, but just the need to work internationally and to um, have a coordinated effort. Um, there's uh, uh, some really great programs out there. I'm sure you're aware of lots of them, and um, taking a regional approach rather than just a site-specific approach. And, that's, I think, the direction we really need to go in. Yeah, that's great, Scott. And I think that we're at a really interesting point in just how much information we're able to collect using good science yeah. and good technology. Right. Yes, sir. On that line, uh, an interesting fact I found just a month ago that in Peru, where we were, the black vultures are helping us determine where dumps are. OK. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah, you know, there's, there's a example of how birds are helping us. Yes. Helping yes. them. Yes. They, they put geolocators on them. Yes. On, and uh, they track their illegal tubs. Right, and, and there's a nice example. Right, that's a really interesting example. There was another that, example of yeah, that albatrosses that were, I think they were tracking down illegal fishing in the Southern Ocean. Right. And it's amazing how, yeah, they can help us. If we put a geolocator on an albatross, they'll smell the fish that are being brought on board and they'll tell scientists where they are. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's only six birds with geolocators, but I guess they've done a heck of a job. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. a cost-effective conservation effort. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. Other questions? Oh, one other question. Yes. We've been lucky enough to see the collection. Uh, has, have they all been photographed? Is that available photographically? I mean, there's people to see. I mean, it's impressive looking at it. Yeah, there's some, uh, we call it digitization when um, the data is all available online. So you can go online and look up any specimens you want. The actual photographs are not, we're sort of working on that slowly, but. We've got a database that you can, yeah, um, you can put in pictures of the specimen, of the habitat where it came. You can put the calls, lots of things. And that's, um, you know, this kind of uh, 
rich information that's going to make uh, science even more exciting. Yeah. Well, I have one last question uh, related to this epic bike ride. That you <laughs> I'm just yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we've talked about it, and I've I've heard more about it. But you know, it came at a time where, as a society, we were struggling, right? Yeah. A pandemic, a lot of racial injustice, a reckoning that was occurring, and you ride across the country with a Black Lives Matter sign <laughs> on the bike across the middle of the country, yeah. and and you you came away um, from that with you know insights into who we are as humans and as one community of people. Can you share just a, a little bit of the insights that you got about society and humanity from that experience? Wow, yeah, thanks. That's, no, it was a really uh, life-changing experience. And um, yeah, you know, it was uh, the idea of putting a BLM sign on my bike. It was, uh, it was just to do a, a little bit when uh, a lot of friends and colleagues were out there protesting in the streets. It's the least I could do. And, you know, I, that sign was on my bike for most of the trip, um, most of the 3,800 miles. Uh, it came down a few places because I didn't think it was a smart thing to be waving a BLM flag in places like eastern Wyoming or northern Idaho. Yeah. Um, but I would say overall, uh, you know, I would say 99 percent of the time folks were excited. I'd get lots of fists in the air and horn honks and that sort of thing. There were a few times when I missed a bed for the night because of that sign. Um, but, you know, uh, it's okay. I think overall my, um, you know, there was a lot of hope on that trip. A lot of people were really generous, welcoming. Plenty of misinformation out there. You know, you know the Democrats are funding the Black Lives Matter movement, right? <laughs> It's like, oh, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> Tell me more. Um, but, um, but I would say a lot of hope. And um, yeah, it's very much a work in progress. But, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, this has been a delightful evening, Scott. It's so great to spend time with you and for you to share your knowledge with us tonight. And thank you, the Concord Museum, Tom, for all that you're doing here. And uh, it's just a pleasure. I think we're, we're all so appreciative that you're here and that you're doing the work you're doing. So thank you. Thank you so yeah. much, David. Really nice. <laughs> that was wonderful. That was fun. That was fun. Yeah, yeah thanks. It's been really fun. I'll do more of that. Okay, I'm coming. You gotta, you gotta find a talk to my class. Okay. It is a lovely quote I'd love to have you blow